The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by Sports of Anarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code Sports of Anarchy 10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. You've heard me say it a bunch of times. Summer's coming. You want to strengthen and tone those abs. Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, could be for you. Follow the link in the description below. And the MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes, this radio podcast app, Stitcher, and now SoundCloud. All of which are available for free to download on all smartphone devices. Chris, take it away. Uh, yeah, on this episode of the podcast, we will be joined by Extreme Cage Fighting President Christian DeBeeris. We're going to talk to him about his upcoming event, ECF5, going down Sunday, May 3rd. And uh, we'll also be talking, recapping UFC 186. And after that, we will talk about the rumors of John Jones being removed from UFC 187. A lot of rumors out there about that one. And, um, unfortunately, Nick had to step away, so I'll be joining Christian myself, one-on-one interview, starting now. Hey, Christian, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, brother? How are you? Hey, I'm good. Um, yeah, let's just get right to this. Uh, we're here with Christian DeFeers, president of Extreme Cage Fighting, amateur promotion. Next event, ECF5, is going down May 3rd, Sunday. As we're right, Sunday, over. May have the cage. Yes, sir. And, uh... Last time we spoke in this interview type setting, it was last summer, right before the first DCF. That took place back last June at Brooklyn and the Aviator. And uh, since then, you've put on three more events. So just tell me, what's changed since then? What improvements have you guys made along the way so far? Well, you know, after every show, you want to improve and make the next one better than the last. Uh, I've been fortunate to have thrown some really successful, great, outstanding shows. And, uh, well, one of the most uh, major improvements was we upgraded and, and we're now at the plush Melrose Ballroom in Astoria, Queens, right next to Manhattan. And uh, that place is absolutely gorgeous. You've been there, you know, three floors, uh, million dollar sound system, giant TV. The Jumbotron there is bigger than anybody else's around. So, you know, uh, it speaks for itself, you know. And uh, obviously, I, I, I always go out and I find the best fighters on the East Coast. I'm, not lazy about it. Uh, I, uh, I travel. I go to I go school to school. I watch these guys train. I, I, I held the tryouts over at my new ECF facility that I recently opened up. So uh, a lot's changed and uh, a lot of improvements have been made. But you know uh, I'm very fortunate. I'm very blessed. Things are going very well. Awesome, man. So um, now we know promoting a show. It's I mean it's basically running a business. It can't be easy, as you obviously know. And uh, the, the the people they may not really know exactly what goes on into running these events so just uh give us a little bit of a rundown on how that goes rundown ready i work all day and all night the second i wake up to the second i go to sleep (laughs) that's it that's the truth man it's non-stop it's not for everybody a lot of people try to do it it's very hard to do it be successful uh it's very hard to do this and do this the right way you know um so it's yeah it's, it's 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 more than i can even explain in one interview you know, from finding the fighters to finding the venue to the perfect setting to the cage to the, you know, <laughs> it's so much involved, believe me. But luckily for me, uh, I was a fighter and a martial artist, first and foremost. And uh, I've uh, participated on all these promotions in New York. So I had a lot to go on and I knew what I needed to do to improve. And uh, I, knew to, I knew what my competition would be like. So, you know, it wasn't very hard for me to put together you know pretty much my dream and make it come true and throw the biggest baddest best show out there in new york and i truly feel that the ecf is that yeah man and uh recently we were speaking getting this whole thing set up and uh you mentioned to me that on the next ecf show ecf6 that uh ken shamrock will be commentating and it'll be live on tv i mean that those are two huge things and the shamrock yeah. name everyone knows that in mma well, what's going on is actually I teamed up with a uh, amazing promotional company called Fighter Source. They actually reached out to me. Uh, I competed for them a couple years back. They hold a amateur national tournament, okay. and every year they kick off the season and they find what they feel are the number one promotions in each region. So for the Northeast region, they chose wisely and they chose the ECF show and myself to host and hold and kick off the first round of their national tournament. So my job, as always, is to go out and find the biggest, best, brightest, and most popular MMA fighters around 
and have them compete. So what's going to happen then is they're going to fight their way on to the Fighter Source national team. And what happens there, every year they are taken to a new location uh, abroad. Last year they did Europe. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if I'm allowed to publicly announce where they're going to be going for the finals this year. So I'm going to keep that on the wraps to the next interview. But it's going to be somewhere amazing. And Ken Shamrock is involved with the Fighter Source national team. So I'm pretty sure uh, he will be commentating on the next event. Uh, he will be coming along with the Fighter Source casting crew. And eight of, I usually hold about 16 to 20 fights. Eight of the fights, eight to 10, will be televised on Time Warner Cable. Uh, what channel, I cannot disclose yet, but that is all 100% going to happen this summer. I mean, man, those are two huge things, like getting an event like that on cable and Ken Shamrock, I mean... Everyone. Yeah, he's a legend. I love him. I, I was on a conference call with him the other day, and, you know, I, it's very rare that I get, you know, I get starstruck or, uh, or, you know... But let me tell you, man, at UFC 1... You know, I'm 14 years old watching this guy, and you know, it changed my life. Him and him and Hoist Gracie watching these guys is the reason why, you know, I do what I do today. So to be on the phone with the man himself, to be involved, and for him to be at the next show is just like a dream come true. Oh yeah, that's awesome. I mean, when you just think about the biggest names in MMA, we have the Shamrocks, the Gracies. Those are two of the biggest names in MMA. When you just talk about the legacy yeah. of the sport, so absolutely. And uh, you know, my awesome. father, uh, stepfather, Bradley Quavas, grew up training with Henzo and Rodrigo Gracie. That's how we originated in the sport. I've been doing this since I'm uh, a teenager, 14, 15 years old. Uh, we train with Henzo, Rodrigo, Matt, Sarah, the original New York crew of MMA. That's where I, I started. That's where my heritage begins, and that's how long and how deep my roots go in the sport. Yeah, and uh, talking about New York and MMA in New York, uh, we know that now we know that the UFC, they're holding a date for Madison Square Garden in December, and it's very possible that pro MMA is going to become legal in New York Jeez. this year. It's very possible due to Selvin, Sheldon Silver getting out of office, Yeah, the corruption. Yeah, so Finally. Yeah, does that actually change things up for you guys? Are you looking to make ECF a pro organization, and what exactly would it take to do that? You know, I... Because it's been illegal in New York for so long, and just recently has the amateur MMA been legal, and I started that immediately when it did. Literally, the month it became legal, I threw my first show. Uh, so now, it's still in the gray area. I mean, I'm going to apply for whatever applications I need to apply, whatever licensing, um, and I'll throw a mixed show. I will throw... You know, I love my amateurs of New York. I'm not going to give up on them. I'm not going to turn my back on them. You know, I'm they're right there. They're, they're, they're where it all begins. So I will probably be doing a half amateur, half pro event from that point on um, and have the main events be pro, of course. And, uh, you know, do, do a 10-10 or 15-5, you know, slowly work my way into uh, a half and half split. But uh, I'm never going to totally throw a pro show. And, and, and uh, turn my back on the amateurs. You know, I love my guys out here. I'm very close with all the fighters. Uh, I'm still a young guy. I still, uh, you know, I still go to the training camps. I still help these guys out. And uh, that's never going to change. Yeah, I mean, that would be really interesting. We do have some events like that in Jersey and with Ring of Combat and CFFC with the yeah, amateurs. I fought, fought ring, I fought a Ring of Combat myself. I fought on all the promotions out there. And, uh, yep, I know that that's it's common in the other states, so I'll probably go along those same lines. Uh, you know, of course, the great Lunaglia, a uh, friend of mine, colleague of mine, uh, I grew up uh, fighting for him. And I was just at his academy the other day. I brought my fighters there to do some sparring. And, uh, you know, he's uh, done a lot for the sport. So, yeah, very similar. I'd probably do the same. Obviously, the UFC would be the main card of New York then. And, you know, but of course, their price for a ticket, you know, starts at a, a ridiculous amount. So, uh, it's it's a big difference, but I'm curious to see how that's going to change the face of the event scene and the promotions in New York, though. Yeah, I think it'll be a welcome change. I think it'll be really fun. And uh, another thing just about keeping the amateur and pro cards, splitting them up, that is a really good way to 
grow these amateur fighters into professionals and have a lot of homegrown talent on your cards. Exactly. I'd love for Dana White to be, you know, asking me where his next fighter is going to be coming from. That would be an amazing thing. And that's what I've been striving for since the very beginning. That's why I pride myself on holding my amateur event just like a pro event. And I say it's an amateur event run professionally. So this way, these guys know exactly what it's like to be under the lights and with the cameras in their face. And when they do go on to becoming great pros, they're not gun shy and camera shy. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense to do that just because you're, you're going to be able to build some stars that way. And it's it's good to have training not only in the fighting side, but through with the media and with things like that, just being able to speak openly. Absolutely. So um, just getting back to ECF5 Mayhem, we have uh, the model is still the same as ECF1. We have amateur MMA, kickboxing, and some no-gi grappling matches in the cage. Uh, tell us Absolutely. Bit, yeah, just tell us a bit about uh, the fights going on. Is, is there anyone in particular, any certain fighters that people should be looking out for on this card? Well, an interesting turn of events is this. It's funny, uh, ECF1, which we were at an interview before, I believe only had three MMA fights. Uh, this one has 15. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, there. there. <laughs> Bring your cameras, pack a lunch, whatever you gotta do. This this is gonna be non-stop action. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and say this straight off the bat. I think I'm one of the best promoters out there right now. The, the fight cards that I put together, the fights that I put together, I can't tell you, each and every fight is gonna be a phenomenal fight. I don't make anything. There's no. There's nothing that's even ever going to be close to a mismatch, a mismatch on my show. Uh, so I can't. We got Manny Gomez versus Ryan Castro for the ECF belt at 155 pounds. Both of these guys are animals. We have Omawale out of Wale fighting Matt Perez for the 175 uh, 170 pound title. Uh, Omawale is an amazing boxer. He's got a pretty cool amateur uh, boxing career, as well as seven MMA fights. You got Matt Perez, who he's fighting, has a, an amateur uh, Muay Thai background with also seven MMA fights. Super fight, man. I mean, he's going to be amazing. Then you have all the guys fighting their way on to the Fighter Source national team. Uh, guys like Taj, uh, the Black Spartan, who's the, currently the ECF K1 champion, is stepping into the octagon to fight, to fight MMA against a Johnny Forrest, another awesome competitor from Yonkers. This guy's jacked. I mean, he looks like a professional <laughs> bodybuilder. It's going to be an amazing, amazing fight. Uh, you know, we just have, honestly, the card is stacked, man. It's a stacked card. And that's just the MMA. We have 15 MMA fights. We have uh, Luis Ruiz Jr. Luis Ruiz is four-time world kickboxing champion. His son will be fighting Muay Thai against... Chris Sillick of Hard Knocks Muay Thai. That's going to be an amazing fight right there. Striking at its best. Uh, we have some amazing grapplers. Amazing. We have um, Chris Paris. Chris Paris is one of the ECF uh, elite MMA gym coaches. Uh, he is actually, he actually beat Chris Weidman twice in wrestling. You believe that? Yeah, that really? He has two wins over Chris White. Where correct. did he beat him? In high school or college? Uh, I believe junior high school and high school. He has wins over him at both. Uh, I will ask him about college. I, I'm, I don't, don't quote me on it, but he has two or three wins. And, he, you know, the third one might, might have been in college because he is a D1 college wrestler. Where does he wrestle? Oh, man. You know, I'm going to ask him. He's a new coach. He came on about four weeks ago. He's there every single day. He's actually competing on the show. He'll be competing in grappling. Uh, he is a pro MMA fighter, undefeated. And uh, gained a little bit of weight. I'm getting him back down to 205. And then I'm going to be putting him back on the pro MMA circuit. But for now, we'll be competing in grappling. And uh, who did I get a matchup for him with? I'll tell you right now. I just confirmed this today. And this guy's awesome. He's a Naga... Uh, champion. He won the uh, absolute division. His name is Ivan Taylor. He just won the Naga Masters uh, at 205. And these guys are beasts, man. I mean, they're some scary dudes. We're talking 6'1", jacked, 
Like you don't want to, you don't want to yeah. be disguised in an alley kind of guys. Yeah, I mean, if you beat Chris Weidman, that says well, a lot. It's especially, this guy, especially, I had him picking up a two hundred pounds higher. He was squatting and throwing it thirty feet away. That's absolutely ridiculous. Freak stuff, man. Freak stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the ladies. We got uh, very well known Ali Franco. She's a very well known fighter on the scene. Uh, she'll be taking on first-time MMA fighter Shay Alexander, and she is one of the ECF elite fighters as well. I've been training her myself uh, for this one, and that's going to be fireworks right there. Yeah, so, I mean, I did, do you actually uh, wind up doing all the matchmaking yourself, or do you have matchmakers in place who do that for you? I do, man. I do it myself. I'm not going to lie. I love it. Uh, I love doing it. It's one of my favorite things. I promote the show, and I matchmake myself. Uh, I reach out to all the fighters, the coaches. I try to watch them all train. I try to, I hold try sparring camps in my place. Uh, I invite everybody down. I travel. I mean, that's the best way. I don't like just taking names and numbers uh, and, and and records and and putting people together without actually, you know, seeing some footage or or getting a look at these guys myself. To be honest with you, and that's why every single fight in the ECF is a phenomenal fight. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, especially because you're still training and you train with some of these guys. You can really see how they feel and how their skills are. Exactly. It makes a lot of sense doing it that way, just because you you have the experience. Exactly. So um, some of our listeners, they might not know, again, that aside from being the president of ECF, you're undefeated in your amateur MMA career. And, uh, that's you hold... What was that? I said that's correct. Thank yeah. you. And uh, you hold several uh, amateur titles in kickboxing and Muay Thai, and uh, you actually run your own gym out in Long Island. So um, the That's last right. time we spoke, you were actually battling a list of injuries, but you did say there was a possibility of you actually getting back in there. So how have things healed up since then? If you step back into a cage or a ring since, are you looking to do so? Uh, well, I do hold five state amateur titles. Thank you for bringing that up. And uh, uh, I no just problem. opened up our new gym, which is the ECF Elite training center which is located 147 sunrise highway in limbrook 9,000 square foot facility 4,000 square feet of mat space 22 foot pro ecf octagon 2,000 square feet of uh, uh weight equipment and cardio equipment training and uh, we're about to open up a new area with the zumba room and fitness kickboxing and all that all that cool stuff yoga uh, so that's new that just opened up a few months ago uh, unfortunately, I was in a pretty bad car accident, and Sorry, I have suffered a terrible, terrible neck injury and back injuries, and I am told from the doctors that it is not a good idea for me to get into the ring of the cage anytime soon. Um, I, I could actually, uh, if I take a wrong fall or kick to the neck, uh, I could possibly get paralyzed in parts of my body. Oh, man. I'm really yeah. sorry to hear about that. I mean, it's very it's a good thing that you're doing so well with the promotion so that you can focus on that and put all your energy into that in your gym. Thank you. That's exactly what I've been doing. I'm blessed, and that's exactly why I've been focusing all my energy. Because <laughs> uh, if not, I'd go nuts, to be honest with you. Uh, I deal with a lot of pain daily, and I think that keeping myself so engulfed in the matchmaking and the, and the ECF and the training, you know, it really keeps my mind and my body busy. Um, you know, it keeps it off the, uh, cause I am in a lot of pain, man. I got some pretty gnarly neck injuries. The doctors are, were very worried about, about me, but, uh, you know, God is good and I'm, I'm a lucky guy. MMA made me strong and, uh, you know, I got, you know, they, they said if it wasn't for all the neck muscles, you know, I could have had a broken neck or something like that. So, you know, it's good, you know, it's good and it's bad. You know, it's a double edged sword. You know, I got to watch and teach and train people. And I'm still young enough to be involved in it, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, I can't right now. And, uh, but, you know, I'm passing my knowledge on to my fighters and I have some amazing, amazing athletes. And I do have some first time fighters coming out of my gym representing me. So that's an extension of myself and, uh, that'll keep my spirit and my, 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 my art going, you know? Yeah, I got you. So, Christian, I just want to thank you again for taking the time out. Once again, ECF5 is going down Sunday, May 3rd at the Melwood Rose Ballroom. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Christian, congrats on all the success. I wish you the best of luck in the thank future. Thank you. Man. Let me just shout out some of my social media. Yeah, uh, go follow me at uh, my Instagram, which is Extreme Cage Fighting. 
one word, uh, and then my Chris Fit MMA, and then also at my gym, which will be Elite Combat Fitness, all on Instagram. And uh, tickets are on sale. You can go to the Melrose Ballroom website to uh, purchase those, or we also have Eventbrite that we're on. And uh, always, you guys can stop by yourselves, or anybody can stop by and do a free trial at my gym, 147 Sunrise Highway, the new ECF Elite Training Center. And thank you guys so much for supporting the show since the beginning. We're going all the way to the top. I know you guys know that. Thank you. Thank you so much for supporting me. Christian, thank you again, man. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you at ECF 5. All right, man. Thank you so much. See you there, brother. Thank you, man. Bye-bye. And that was Christian DeFiris. And I'm now rejoined by uh, my host, Nick Peralta, co-host, and uh, MMA D admin, Adam. What's going on, guys? Bruh. So Adam. Adam. I, I, and he overstepped me, so I was gonna shut up for the real host to talk. <laughs> oh damn! What's up, dude? We haven't had Adam on in a long ass time. Where you been, hey, dude? Man, how you been? How's everything we've gone? Yeah, not bad. School's wrapping up, so it's gonna really open me up. So nice. Yeah, work, ditto. So. Working on that degree. Yeah, pretty much. Oh man, school's like the worst right now. It's term papers and shit all gotta be turned in. But enough about that. <laughs> Two days removed from UFC 186. That fight card was off the chain despite uh, anybody's thoughts to the contrary. It was a mad card. Great fi- great fights, great finishes. There were there was there was literally very few moments in this card that I really didn't have any fun. It was amazing, it was fun. I had a uh, it ended off on on such a high note and uh, for me it, I, I knew it could be a great card, and sure enough, it was, and so I'm happy I was right. Chris, what about you? I know you had your doubts about this card. What are your overall takeaways at the end of it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it a great card. I would call it a really fun, exciting card. There was a lot of finishes. We had some mismatches on there. We had a few fun fights. But, oh, um, miss- <laughs> what? <laughs> no, there was, some, there was just some fights right. where, like, Shane Campbell versus John McDessie, it was a one-sided fight. Maybe well, that, well, that shouldn't even bit, count because it was... Maybe a, it that's was... a little bit better of a way to describe it, one-sided, maybe not a mismatch. That shouldn't even count because Shane Campbell took that fight on three weeks' notice. No, yeah, I know. I know, but I'm just saying there were there were some one-sided fights in this card, but it was a good card. It was fun. It was definitely fun and exciting. I had a good time watching it. I, I love watching MMA. I just think that cards like 187 are just a lot more riding on those cards. This card was it was definitely fun to watch, though. It had its moments. Adam, what about you? Did you happen to watch the card? I didn't even ask you. Yeah, um, I came in... Uh, I saw the ending of the first card on Fox Sports 1, watched the entire thing. Um, it, it was one of those cards where it's like, looked like, it started off good on paper, looked like shit on paper by the end, but the, how many times do we say this? The ones that are shit on paper turn out to be the most exciting. And, yeah. and I, I'm curious what happened. I mean, it wasn't the most exciting card ever, but, you know, watch the fight before you really break down the card. That's, that's, that's really what it always comes down to. Mm-hmm. I, I had a great time with it from top to bottom. I think the only one, the one fight that I didn't enjoy watching was the uh, the Cote Riggs fight. That was kind of that was the only blunder of the card. Uh, every other I watched every fight on this card and every fight delivered. Uh, my my favorite being the Bisping Dalloway fight, which I was surprised oh, didn't get fight of the night. Yeah, and then the second I thought, my, it, did, I thought it deserved it too. Yeah, and then my second favorite fight of the night was Jessica Ricosi versus. Uh, Valerie, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that those two fights were my favorite, and of of course the finish from Demetrius Johnson at the very end of that fight. Um, for <laughs> that was amazing. That was yeah. That was ridiculous. That was something something special. But uh, we'll get into that when we get there. Yeah, that, I mean, uh, we can start from the bottom of the card, I guess. Or at least let's somewhere. Let's start with uh, the Fox Sports prelims. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, your um one of uh one of your favorites, Olivier. Um. Ben Mercier, as everybody's starting to call him Olam now. <laughs> Olam, just stick with Olam. Olam sounds weird. I said Olam, O O A M, like his O-A-M. initials. Yeah, right. the yeah. very good performance. He definitely uh, took, you know, took the fight where he he, he was best at, at most advantageous. He uh, of course is such a spectacular grappler, and of course uh, got another Rene Gachoke uh, submission highlight reel added to his. Uh, you know his uh, resume. Um, I-, I thought he looked fantastic, Chris. Oh yeah, he looked outstanding. He looked like he always does. He uh, beat up Mashad on the ground, basically just kept taking him there, looking to get the fight there, and he had a good game plan. 
he did what he had to do. I thought he was going to get the sub a little bit earlier. He took uh, Michelle's back a few times. Michelle put up a fight against a lot of those takedowns, getting himself to the cage, helping himself stay up. But when um, Mercier got him down, he had a lot of trouble getting up, and he got in a lot of bad positions. And then at third round, when he got the rear naked choke, Michelle just looked too tired to even defend it any longer, and that was it. Adam, I don't know if you saw this fight. Did you see the finish at all? Yeah, I saw the finish, and from what I saw, I came in, like, literally about halfway through the second round, so halfway through the fight. When I watched Aubin Mercier fight, especially on the ground, he reminded me when I started jiu-jitsu, when I started to respect how tight and controlling someone can be on top, how that'll quickly drain you. And Aubin Mercier was very controlling and very tight on top. You know, you know, Michelle, you know, was doing good scrambling, trying to get some room, but he was expending so much energy trying to defend and trying to get up that, you know, there, there, was a, there was a clear mismatch on the ground, and Aubin Mercier was spending very little energy while Michelle was doing everything he could to avoid and get up. So I think that was the, the, the moral of the story, you know, how to fight on the ground, especially how to control on the ground and win a fight that way. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And a lot of people don't realize until they get in there and start training that when a guy's holding you down like that and you're just trying to get up, keep getting controlled, keep getting taken down, it does expend so much energy. And that leaves you open for submission so easy when you're just bucking. and Especially when you're at that point where you can't move and you're just freaking out and you're exploding one way and exploding the other yeah. way. That's when things get left out there. Yeah, if you're not one of those high-level guys, you get into desperation mode pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I've been there. <laughs> Yeah, it was a great, uh, great fight overall. I know Chris, you had an idea of who you wanted him to uh, to see him fight next. Ooh, I forgot what I said last time. <laughs> the, Nick and I were watching the fights together. I was looking around who I thought would be a good fight for him next, but um, I'm just gonna look into that real quick. We can move on to the next one while I look for it. Um, all right, and which one was the next one? That was uh, Chad Lapree versus who was his opponent? Uh, Ryan Barbarena. <laughs> yeah, I ended up winning uh, fight of the night. Um, I was surprised by that, but it was a good fight, so uh, I won't. That was my favorite fight on the card, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it was a great fight for sure. Um, uh, I, I was definitely impressed with Lapree's striking. Uh, he looked good starting off, and then uh, throughout the middle of the uh, card, uh, certainly, um, <clears throat> certainly, uh, Brian Barbarina tried making a comeback. Ended up winning that that last round, in my opinion. It's by no means was a thirty twenty seven that I thought by that one judge, um, but it was a great fight for sure. Lapree getting another uh, victory. I think he remains undefeated. Is now eleven and zero. Um, with that, I I don't know who I'd want to see him fight next, but you know he's got uh, yes eleven no ten and zero. Okay, got it. Um, who I would want to see him fight next, I'm not entirely too sure. Uh, Chris, Adam, you got any ideas? Of uh, what, if who Lepree should fight next? Yeah. Um, just talking, I don't know exactly, I don't really have any ideas of who he should fight next, I should probably look into that a little more, but, uh, just talking about the fight itself, uh, Lepree was looking great in that first round, just landing, outstriking Barbarin, and just having his way with him on the feet, and then... Barbarina just seems like one of those guys who has so much endurance and is just so tough that if he gets out of that first round, he's just going to keep putting it on. He'll make you tired. And even I don't know. He's very odd. Like Even though a guy can be so much better than him, he'll make them – like he'll just make it his fight. Like He'll barely take the second and third round, which was – it looked like a possibility in that fight because they were so close. And I don't know. He gets in these dog fights and comes out looking real good towards the end of them. Adam, any last thoughts? That lightweight division, by the way, has so many fighters. It's really hard to ever gauge who they'll fight next. There's like a hundred fighters in that lightweight roster. Yeah, there are a lot of fighters. I was watching that fight. I don't remember at what point, but there was a time where I thought to myself, this is an MMA fight. Like, this is every aspect of MMA, and it hit it, and it, it flowed from point to point to point. I was thinking like, you know, four or five years ago when we talked about what MMA would be in the future, it's a fight like that. That's why I think I really enjoyed it, because it really incorporated everything. And either man really did slow down. Barbarina did pick it up at the end, but, I mean, it's not like the free slowed down that much. Um, I think that's really why I enjoyed that fight, because it just it wasn't – it was nonstop. It hit all aspects. The cage work wasn't a stall fest. The groundwork wasn't a stall fest. The striking wasn't, you know, useless jabs to the air or nothing getting done. It was just a good fight. I mean, that's the best way to put it. 
Yeah, it was definitely a good fight. I think I have to disagree. I think Laprise did uh, slow down a little bit. Because, I mean, he was outclassing Bob Brandon in that first round. Then he just started throwing less volume in the second and third. Yeah, I mean, well, he did slow down. But I wouldn't say, like, you know, he's got bad endurance or anything. I, I mean, I, that's kind of what I was saying. It's, you know, no, I don't think so. I just think Bob Brandon is so good endurance-wise that he's able to, when guys slow down, he's able to stay at the same pace as he is in the first. And I think that's the point I was trying to make. With like no knock on Laprise and Burns, just sometimes people like Barb Rayner, you think back to a prime Clay Guida, they just don't stop. They go, they go, and that's one of their advantages. Yeah, definitely more. Um, oh man, that's gonna be a fun fight. I or I mean, I what I think would be a fun fight. I just saw a name that I, that really uh comes uh, out to me honestly is um Chad Laprise versus um oh has he signed yet? Hold on. Oh, I'm tripping out. I'm looking at the Bellator roster. I don't know why I thought Justin Lawrence was in, M or in the UFC. That's not a different fight entirely. I'm so slow. <laughs> nah, well, hmm. yeah. yeah no, just so many guys that are just like in that top 25 to 30 area at lightweight that it's hard to find so many matchups for them. A lot of them are booked too. Yeah, for sure. Until then, we'll oh, leave that alone. But I do remember who I thought. Uh, one of these guys, either Laprise or OAM, should get uh, maybe McDessey next. I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, McDessie is coming off a loss, and even though it was a loss that none of us agree with, but yeah, um, I don't think anyone agreed with that one. But uh, yeah, I think they, that's a possibility, especially since they fought on the same card. A lot of guys are booked too. Yeah, we'll move on to one of my uh, favorite finishes on the card: Alexis Davis versus Sarah Kaufman. Sarah Kaufman coming into this fight had already beaten Davis twice prior, um, and that and but. Davis getting some revenge, man. That that triangle to armbar setup finish was fantastic, and uh, unfortunate that the ref wasn't able to see Sarah tapping when she did. Oh no, that but, guy uh, should not be refing fun. <laughs> oh, I I can't wait to rip into that dude. <laughs> well, okay, I'll get to you uh, a second. Adam, what did you think of the the fight and the submission? Uh, it, it's it's pretty much striker versus grappler, and it came like talking about how Laprise and Barbarina was the future of the sport. Alexis Davis and Kaufman was kind of a throwback. Kaufman was lighting her up, and then Davis won by submission. You know, it's it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of fun to see those kind of throwback aspects where someone's got a, such a huge strength this way, someone's got such a huge strength the other way, and to see it play out that way, I enjoy those kind of things. So. Yeah, same here. I um, I, I was definitely uh, Sarah definitely was winning the striking exchanges, no doubt about it. And then, uh, of course, uh, Davis is able to take it into a world and took full advantage and set it up very nicely. I mean, uh, Sarah tried powering out of it as only she can, and Davis actually used it to take advantage. Got the uh, you know, scared with the triangle. Sarah Kaufman trying to fight it off, and then used that. Um, her reaction off that to set up the armbar perfectly. Uh, I was so impressed. And uh, as far as Alexis Davis, I'd actually I was calling for this. I think that she and Holly Holm should fight next. What do you think, Adam? That kind of makes sense. Like, which is where they're all, where both of them are at. And that's mm -hmm. another striker versus grappler kind of fight. And you know, not not a knock against Eric Hoffman, but if it was Holly Holm fighting Alexis Davis, that fight may not have gone to the second round. Mm-hmm. We'll see. I mean, that's the kind of test Holly needs right now moving forward, and, uh, in my opinion. Chris, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'll, first I'll talk about uh, the matchups next. I think um, four girls that could be matched up are Holly Holm, Juliana Pena, Amanda Nunes, and Al Alexis Davis. Those four, I feel like any of them can be matched up around each other. They all fought recently, uh, aside from Holm, who fought a little bit ago, but is still looking for a matchup. So... I can see any of those four getting mixed around, getting thrown there against each other. Um, as for the fight, yeah, as you guys were saying, it was a striker versus grappler fight. Uh, Kaufman was throwing out her jabs, a lot of straight punches, looking better on the feet, obviously took the first round. And then I think she went in for a takedown. They just got in a clinch, and Davis threw her. Kaufman got stuck underneath uh, the mount, I believe, and went to escape out the back door. And then we saw uh, Davis set up the triangle and switch it over to an armbar. And I just want to rip into the referee real quick. Uh, Jaron Vallel. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly. I was looking. I think it's Jaron Vallel. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. What the hell was that guy doing? This is like <laughs> the third time this guy has done something. He was the referee. Well, he was. Didn't we say this going into the fight? Me, Nick and I were watching the fights together. Didn't you mention, oh, great, it's the ref who almost let Munoz get killed? Yeah. <laughs> Jaron Vallel. 
I'm going to keep saying his name because everyone should know it. This guy should not be refing. He was completely out of position for that arm bar. Yeah, it's hard to see the arm, but that's ridiculous. And uh, Kenny Florian actually tweeted out something funny. Think about this. If Jaron Vallow was refereeing the main event, DJ would have never gotten the arm lock finish. <laughs> Dude, that guy was like a good five to ten seconds late. Like, that's ridiculously late. That's one of those mistakes that you might lose your job for, especially because it's not the first time. I don't even think, I think it's third or fourth time he's done something like this, and he's putting these people in danger. Like, it's it's very dangerous to have a ref in there who's not doing his job correctly. When guys are getting choked out, they can get their arms broken. They can Their careers can be put in total jeopardy just because this guy doesn't know how to do his job in the correct way. So, yeah, they got to do something about that. Uh, I I don't know if it's the third or fourth. Uh, all I know is the Mark Munoz one. Do you know of another one that I don't know about? Um, I swear I saw him in there in a different one, but regardless of the fact... If a guy's getting choked out and he's unconscious clearly in front of your face and you don't stop the fight, that guy can get You have someone's arm when, like, Sarah Kaufman starts screaming at that point after she tapped, like, 30 times. Mm -hmm. You can't have a guy out of position like that and he doesn't look like he knows what he's doing at all. Adam, what are your thoughts? It's refs like that that kind of make fighters like Kutumar Palhari to understand why they feel they have to do the things they do. Because, I mean, if Paul Harris had a leg lock, someone tapped and he gave it up, this ref would fuck him over. Because he wouldn't see anything like that. So, I mean, n I mean, not not to change the subject on holding submissions too long, but with a ref like that, you kind of have to. You have to go past gentlemanship and sportsmanship and just make sure the fight's freaking over. And, you know, you know the same, guy, same thing with the guy who had to tell the ref the guy was out. You know? I'm sick of bad refs. I just hate that kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, I don't blame Alexis Davis for one bit. She held on to it until the ref stopped it, but that well, can put people on serious jeopardy. Yeah, I mean, this, that's the thing. You can't blame, like, a stake off in a broken arm. It's not Davis' fault that the ref was like, she's not tapping. I'll just sit here and have a bag of chips. You know, you can't blame Davis for that. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty bummed out. Uh, I mean, I. I wouldn't want anybody to get hurt because of a referee's mistake, and he's kind of on his way there. I mean, who knows how many times he'll luck out before somebody does actually get hurt with him ref in the fight. So, I mean, I don't know. Whatever. Uh, where was this fight? This fight was in – what city was this fight in? This was in Canada. So, I don't know. When, where was he? Yeah, he refed here in L.A. So, I mean, he's obviously ref in multiple areas, which is scary. Yeah, it was in uh, Quebec. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. I don't know. I don't. I don't like this guy refing no more. For sure, definitely. I have a problem with it, and uh, and he's right. And that's sad. The second somebody taps once, the ref should be on that shit and on you to get you off. You know what I mean? I mean, it better better the fighter look like a dick than the ref because then it's the fighter's fault and they're supposed to be able to you know stop when the ref says stop. And then that there's there's this, there's that order. But if the ref's not saying stop and you're not stopping, and the person gets hurt. It's the ref's fault. And then you know it's just this big huge fucking ugh. It's just bad. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think feel like going to get punished probably, and that's the problem. Yeah, that's another thing. These, these, a lot of these commissions are too prideful to fuck. Yeah, and that too to to even do anything about it. This is the most annoying thing ever. Uh, I mean, unless there's some financial cost to it, like what me and Jonas honestly agree on, thinking that the ref that cost Drew Dauber his fight earlier this year. Um, when it when it comes to you know fans and people saying you know it'd be it would suck to do an event there again and when you know when you're criticized on a level like that then it's uh then then stuff happens you know yeah luckily no one got hurt otherwise I'm sure that ref would have gotten even more ridiculed which I don't want to have to wait until that happens I would like it if they'd see it now seeing hey there's like a there's a trend you got going here and it's bad you know yeah exactly uh, and to your point I think that the the refs, they, aside from the training they do have, which they do have, they have to get certified, but outside of that, I think they should be training. Maybe just basic training just to know the positioning so you know where to be when things happen. Certain things happen, you have to know where to be at the right time. And the trained refs, the guys who train in jiu-jitsu and things of that nature, they seem like the best refs in most cases. So I think well, that's the fight. What was that? Unless their training partner is one of the guys fighting and the ref. Oh, fight. yeah, no, of course not. But, I mean, they should have some some type of training, especially jujitsu-wise, because, like, you can tell when a guy, if you're a trained ref and you're certified, a lot of times you can tell 
for the most part, when a guy is out, get knocked out, or when a guy is getting beat up too much and they're TKO'd, they're not in it, because you can just tell by their face, but a lot of times you have to know jiu-jitsu to be able to see what's going on. Yeah. I agree. Um, like I said, hope it's, hope it's the last time this guy at least makes that mistake. I was even saying it, too. I was like, great, if there's a submission, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> you should never have to say that about a ref. Yeah. Hopefully moving forward, that won't be the issue no more. I'll certainly be holding my breath if I see him ref again. Moving on, we got the main event of the prelims, I guess you could call it, uh, which was the only stinker for me. But, you know, that's just me. I don't know if any of you agree. But Joe Riggs versus Patrick Cote, which, um, you know, definitely I wouldn't say that Cote's game plan was bad. I just would say his, his lack of action was what was kind of, uh, you know, um, kind of bothering me in the sense that I, I like that his improved grappling was on display, but he wasn't doing as much as he could have. You know what I mean? Um, but he got the victory, got the unanimous decision. I agreed with it. Uh, Joe Riggs just didn't have an answer. I mean, he did, uh, attempt to get his back numerous times and get the choke or the TKO. So props to him for that. Um, but you know, obviously Cote was able to hang in there. He's been in the game a while. Both men really have, um, I'm surprised Joe Riggs is 32. Honestly, that's a surprising fact that I found out while watching this card. He doesn't oh, man, look he 32. Like <laughs> yeah, man, I was definitely shocked and surprised by that. So, um, you know, uh, but I, de man, I, I would like it if Cote is going to start utilizing his grappling that he utilizes his striking along with it. I didn't see much of that uh, in this fight, so. Um, that being said, a uh, good win for Cote. I hope he keeps moving forward. I believe that's his third win in a row, so we'll see what happens. Adam, what did you think of the fight? Um, you know, you kind of just said everything, you know. I mean, look at a guy like DJ on top, or how a guy like Bisping when he's on top. There's a clear difference in activity than when, what you saw with Cote. I mean, he got, he was, I remember, I just think they remember him working with Kimura so hard from half guard, you're like, you're not going to get that, probably. Oh, right? I, I said the exact same thing. <laughs> Such energy on a position where you're not going to get it. And he wasn't using that, that, that you know, Kimura setup for the pass, which is what a lot of people do. And when they're doing a setup for Kimura and half guard, you use that to pass all the way to side control. Maybe you'll have the arm, maybe you won't, but you're in a better position. He wasn't doing that. He passed side control after the Kimura was gone. I'm like, well, what was the point of any of that? <laughs> that's just that's the waste of my time. And, you know, it's like, when he was active, it wasn't smart. When he should have been active, he was just holding Joe Riggs, which Joe Riggs is, is a good grappler. You don't want to give him an advantageous position. I mean, he's, he's he's been in the game. He knows what to do when he's in full guard or if he could get on top. Obviously, when he got the, didn't get his back like early in the first round. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he didn't like he got his hear back the, in like 10 seconds. Yeah, he didn't. The hook, right? Or he was, no, I think it was the one he secured one hook and then tried his hardest to secure the other one, but kept yeah, on his back for a few seconds. Out. Yeah, it, it, I, th I thought I remember something like he went for a body triangle too quick and like tried to go for the choke. And the body that was in the off. second round, I believe, though. He had his back twice in that fight, if I recall. Um, but I mean, yeah, it was just you know, yeah, yeah, yeah that basically on. speaks to me on that how that fight was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was an average fight. We saw some. Uh, Joe, Riggs, Joe Riggs took the back a couple times. We saw some things, especially with that Kimura with Cote. It seems like a lot of the times we see guys were like, "All right, you know what you're doing. Why are you doing shit that like white belts learn not to do?" I mean, it seems kind of odd that you have to see that. And we saw Riggs take the back in the first and third. I think it was. I think Riggs wound up winning the third round due to back control and. Uh, he just couldn't finish Cote. Cote's a good enough grappler where he kept Riggs from securing the choke. And he won most of the rounds everywhere. So that's all I really have to say about that one. Not too much to say. I got a random question. When's the last time we saw Kimura from full guard? Uh, oh, Joe Lozon at like UFC Fight Night 20-something. Uh. Uh, that's what I can distinctly remember is when Verdun got over him in a closed guard Kimura in Pride. It's been that long since I've like, seen one that I remember, so I was just, I was just curious if either you remember it. Oh, Mark Hunt and Sean McCorkle. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was more, wasn't that more of a straight arm bar, or was that a more? I don't remember. Uh, it may have been a straight arm bar. I just remember you. are talking close guard from the top, right? Yeah, yeah. When Mark Hunt, that was Mark yeah. Hunt's first fight in the UFC. Like, uh, doing the Kimura to the 
guy on top and close guard. You can't really do a close guard when you're on top, or a more when you're on top. You're just, you're oh, flat. yeah, I, I know that. That's why I was asking. I was a little bit confused for a second there because we were talking half guard on top. But from bottom, Kamoras, I, I mean, they're not typical Kamoras from guard from bottom, but you see them every once in a while. They're not too rare. Yeah, I just... When I was seeing that, I was thinking of submissions you just don't see. So that's kind of what I popped in my head at the time of the fight. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty rare we see guys finish it. I actually, uh, in the gym, I like going for Kamoras from full guard instead of half. Yeah, that, that can also lead to a good sweep. If they're trying to compensate for the arm, you know, to alleviate the yeah. pressure. Actually, we'll on. That's a conversation with different Oh, guys. yeah, I just feel it's easier to keep them in position with your legs and keep them from escaping out from full guard, actually. Yes. Oh, yeah. Especially if you can just get your hips out and get to the side. I mean, Especially if, if they're posturing over you. It's like the... Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. If you can get your hips out and get to the side, it's less of a strength move or more of a leverage move. It's yeah. such a, a common misconception that the Kimura is all strength. It's really... If you know what you're doing, it's all leverage. All yeah. leverage. <laughs> yeah. That... This conversation has become more exciting than that fight. This <laughs> main card. Now, I was saying last uh, when we were prepping up for this uh, event that you know I was expecting a, an upset, but I, I guess the, the the Las Vegas betting odds makers uh, caught wind of what I was saying and decided to make Almeida the favorite for this fight. Now, Almeida was a huge favorite. Yeah, <laughs> he wasn't a huge favorite. He's like a two to one favorite. No, he was, I think he was, he was a pretty big favorite. He was a two or three to one favorite, no, no more than three. Three to one favorite is big, dude. All right, fuck. Um, all right, <laughs> three to one favorite. So, <laughs> Almeida went in there, 18 and 0 record. I was definitely, I was eating the hype up. Uh, and sure enough, he pulled true. I mean, he was able to show such a excellent striking against Yves Dubois. And, um, you know, uh, Yves Dubois not known much for his striking, more so than, you know, his, his overall game has always been able to give him decisions in the last few years. It's kind of how he's uh, been operating. Uh, but Thomas Almeida just basically broke down, broke him down, uh, essentially. And then, of course, getting the finish um, at the uh, near the end and got the TKO. And, uh, you know, other than that, I mean, I don't know what else to say. It was such a great performance. Um, beautiful first round finish. Um, now 19 and 0. I mean, no matter how you put it, 19 straight wins is is legit. So, um, I don't know who we see him fight next. Bantamweight is kind of open right now. So, whatever comes up next, uh, Chris, you got any ideas? Um, I'll just talk about the fight first. I don't know who exactly see him in there next. He was just really, really impressive. A lot of people are ready to get on the Thomas Almeida hype train. I mean, he perfectly technical. We saw him get taken down once, but aside from that. He won the fight. He was landing hard shots, and he got the TKO of Yves Dubuin, who's a veteran in there. And he's not that easily beaten by guys, so that's really impressive. I'm actually interested in seeing who he fights next. I'm not entirely sure who that would be, but uh, there's probably some matchups out there just outside of the top 15, I would suspect. And Adam, what did you think of that performance? Uh, first off, shout-out to Old School Shootabox. Always cool when Shootabox is back in the house. Um, <laughs> It was one of those weird fights where it's like, you know, if I'm thinking of the right one, because I might be in this and in the, like, that's the one confused, but, like, he had him rocked, like, three or four times, he just never went down, right? He, yeah. He, him on, he clipped yeah. him good enough to know that he was in trouble, for sure. I'm like, just get him out! Just make sure he, uh, but I understand why the rap has to stop, and it's not, you know, either guy's fault, but it just it always is up for some kind of booing or some kind of bad reaction when the guy's out on the you know outstanding on the cage. It was it was a good stoppage. Don't get don't get me wrong or anything, but uh that was I mean the whole shoot a box style. Uh, I'm going to hurt you and I don't care if you hurt me. And as much as we know more about brain injuries and shit like that, it's still cool. <laughs> yeah. and that's why we all love the sport in the beginning. It's mm -hmm. seeing people get brutalized. Yeah, definitely. I think a good matchup that can tell us where he is, and, and from the grappling side, grappling side of things, uh, I, I wouldn't mind Chris Holdsworth, the Ultimate Fighter winner. Yeah, that's a good one. Because I, I kind of wish, like, if Wineland was still, still around, I'd like to do something like that. I know Wineland would be a lot higher ranked than him, but it would be, you know, a fun fight to see. But Wineland I certainly know. needs a victory. He's on uh, about uh, was it a two fight losing streak, getting knocked out in his last fight. Um. Ooh. What'd you say? I'm sorry. Why not retire? I don't know if he did. I don't know if he retired. I know he uh when he got knocked out by Johnny Eduardo, he uh 
he broke his jaw, so he needed to get that. That was a while ago. That was like a, way over a year ago, I believe. So I don't know if he's ready to get back in there yet, but I don't know if he was retired. Yeah, no, he's still actively on the roster, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think Eduardo's fought since then either, but uh, another fight that would make sense, I don't know if they'd want to do it, but uh, no, I don't I don't know. They could do Aljamain Sterling, even though he just came off that big win over Mizugaki, but I don't think they'd want to do that. Especially yeah, I, I don't think that's the rankings. Yeah, I don't yeah. think that's smart. Actually, Eddie Wyland doesn't have not not two losses. He actually knocked out Eve Dubuane the fight prior to Johnny Eduardo. So Eve's having a tough time. <laughs> okay. is that my, what is that? Two finishes straight? I'm kind of curious now. But uh, yeah, I like that fight. Chris Holdworth and Thomas Almeida. It would definitely show us where Chris is if he's uh, improved at all. Uh, it would show us if Almeida is the kind of fighter who can take off a guy with good enough grappling and wrestling and heavy. Uh, and heavy ground and pound. Um, so I like that Holdworth, fight. Holdsworth's undefeated too, correct? I believe he is, yeah. Yeah, he has a uh, 6-0 record. Five submissions. I like it. That's the fight I want to see next. Both yeah, guys are 2-0 and thus far, so I think it makes sense. Makes sense. Moving on. Uh, John McDessie versus Shane Campbell. Now Shane Campbell taking this fight on on three weeks' notice. Most famously known for the Hadouken he threw in his previous World Series of Fighting fight, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty cool. I thought I thought it was funny. Um, came into this fight on short notice. I honestly believe that his kickboxing uh, resume was going to uh, shine through and make it a decent fight with McDessey. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> it wasn't that at all. Um, McDessey coming in there showing off his striking prowess and I mean he, he always looks fantastic in there on the feet um, definitely tightened up uh, almost every punch he threw and uh, of course uh, Shank, props to Shane for taking as many punches as he did he got dropped twice very badly <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know of course was able to get the finish out of there before the before the end of the first round and uh, John McDessey I believe now uh, was that, he's coming off a loss prior to that victory I think right uh, Alan Patrick, yeah, I yeah. don't think he wanted to leave this one in the hands of the judges. That's Hell to the no. That was a great fight, though. I mean, his punches look so tight. He was he, he knew where to come in. He knew how to shoot on the inside. He knew he had to reach this advantage, but took full advantage of his speed and got in there. And, and man, those heavy punches land so fast. I mean, uh, I think the guy with the hardest punch in the main of card was him. I don't think a guy punched anybody harder than the guy than the punches he was landing on that main card. To be honest with you. And um, I was certainly uh, impressed with it, and I, I would like to see if my, McDessey can take a uh, take his uh, take a step further. You know, I mean, uh, he's been around a while, but you know, he hasn't really gotten any um, huge uh, fights yet. He hasn't gotten any big names that have really gotten there. He kind of loses his footing before he can gather any momentum. So, with that being said, I don't know who he would fight next. Uh, I don't know, like guys like Ram Ramsey Nijem come to mind only because, you know, I still think he needs to get one or two more uh, decent ones before he can get uh, get on to the bigger names of, of his uh, very packed division. Um, Chris, any thoughts? And what uh, yeah. did you think of the fight? Um, yeah, just talking about the fight, um, John McDessey looked really good. He definitely didn't want to let the judges get that one after the Patrick fight. He just went in there, took care of business, landed a lot of hard shots, really hard punches to Shane Campbell, and just kind of had his way with him on the feet. He just looked like the better fighter. It props to Shane Campbell for taking it on short notice, taking the spot of Abel Trujillo, which I wish we would have seen that fight. But um, maybe you can give him Trujillo next and try to make that fight happen again. I wouldn't mind that. And uh, McDessie was actually on a pretty good streak until that Patrick loss. Right now he could be riding five straight. He beats Stout, Crookshank, Henne Forte. Uh, Patrick, he lost two, and then he just beat Shane Campbell. So, I mean, props to McDessey. He should get a, a pretty good fight after this one. I was impressed by his performance. Adam. Yeah, I, I don't really think you can move McDessey up all that much. Um, I mean, that was pretty much an elaborate squash match where it was John Mc... The, the best thing about that was the fact that Shane Campbell was top. That was really the best part about that fight, or else it would have been over much quicker. Um, in... Can you do much with McDessey other than put him against his original opponent, Trujillo? That's really all I think you can do. I mean, McDessey looked really good, but if he looked anything less than really good, he would have really disappointed. So, I mean, he did his job. He did the very minimum he was supposed to do. And, you know, I say just continue with what was, you know, planned beforehand. 
I agree with that. That's fair enough. For sure. Hopefully uh, he can keep that kind of performance pace going and the momentum going, and uh, we'll see how he looks his next fight. Moving on to the next fight, Michael Bisping versus C.B. Dalloway, which was my fight of the night, personally. Um, terrific fight. And, uh, you know, Michael Bisping got some early momentum on uh, from the get. Um, utilizes, uh, his, his, of course, his very uh, methodical type of technical striking, utilizing also his cardio to, to really set up uh, combinations and get out of the way of dangerous strikes. Didn't end up working just like he'd liked because uh, CB did land some good shots and, of course, was able to drop him at the end of that round. And in, in what was thus far very close, considering CB was able to land decent shots, I felt Bisping was outstriking him by that point. But once CB dropped him, I felt, okay, um, you know, that makes sense for me, you know, that I, that I would give CB the first round, you know what I mean? So with that, I gave uh, CB the first round, but then Michael Bisping got his, uh, his shit together. Was able to, um, uh, was of course able to take the, uh, advantage, got the next two rounds, and I was impressed. Great performance by Bisping. I mean, it was kind of what I expected, but overall I was still impressed. Uh, Adam, what did you think? Kind of, kind of like midway through the first round, I kind of thought to myself, yeah, this is a Michael Bisping kind of fight. Um, he fought his kind of fight. He was very aggressive the entire time, uh, constantly pushing, and Bisping's takedown defense has always been underrated, and I think that was put on display, he was able to wear out CB with his, with his pressure, which he does that to a lot of people, and he makes a lot of Michael Bisping fights, he, you know, pattered away at him, never landed anything all that heavy, you know, like he doesn't punch heavy, and just, you know, did what he did, you know, will he ever be champ? Probably not, that he wants to rain yeah, I'm that good, I don't know, I mean, Bisping, is, is he plateaued, will he be any better, that's, I mean, Bisping's kind of in this one last run kind of phase in his career, I think. I don't think he'll get many other chances. So let's see. Let's just see what more wrinkles he can add to his game. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I agree with everything you guys said pretty much. Um, Bisping's 36 now. He's getting up there in age. As Adam said, he probably has one last run in him. He beat a tough guy in CB Dalloway. Uh, apparently, Talia's ladies was calling him out on Twitter, so maybe they'll make that fight happen. That would be a pretty good one, or you can give him the winner of uh, Musasi versus Costa Filippo that's coming up. Either way, it'll move him up the rung, another one. And um, for the fight, uh, yeah, Bisping was doing what he does. He was working. I thought he was he was winning round one. He was winning it like it wasn't where he was winning it marginally enough where that punch by Dalloway didn't win Dalloway the round. Dalloway knocking down Bisping, eked out the round for him because Bisping was clearly winning that first round until that point. And then from there, he just kept doing what he had to do. He was throwing his punches, typical Bisping fight, throwing a lot of punches. He threw some weird spinning back fist uh, combination with a, I don't know what the hell kind of kick that was, honestly. It was a weird kick. <laughs> <laughs> where the one where he threw his arm at the same time? <laughs> yeah, he threw his uh, arm and leg at the same time, spinning back fist, but I don't know what kind of kick that would be called, honestly. It was just so weird that I can't even think of the name for it. But, um... Yeah, no, it was a fun fight. I thought it was fight of the night, too. I thought they definitely should have won that. Bisping's takedown defense, again, was on point. He was able to stop a lot of Dalloway's takedowns. And Dalloway's a tough wrestler, so there's not many guys who'll be able to hold Bisping down. He's still one of the top 10 guys in the division. He's never been able to get his way to the title shot. I still don't think he'll be able to, but I wouldn't be surprised if Bisping works his way back up to somewhere near the top five. He's been looking really good lately. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I agree with Adam. I really don't see him ever winning a title. Um, but I do think that um, Bisping will forever be the gatekeeper of that division. He's still certainly the guy to beat at that divi at that weight class. I mean, he certainly can fight his way out of that status, but for now that's where I have him. Um, yeah, I feel like there's different tiers of gatekeepers, though. He's that guy, like, he used to be the guy, if you beat him, you get the title shot. Now he's kind of that guy, if you beat him, you're in, like, the top five. Yeah, he certainly needs to work his way back up. He seems motivated to do so. Um, so with that, I mean, uh, who would he fight next? Uh, Tali's ladies. Is yeah, that's the one. I that's the one I threw out there. Tali's ladies. I actually like that one. Ladies I don't know. Called them out, and then you have. Uh, Does ladies have a fight or no? Philip Mousasi winner. You can give. Yeah. Does ladies have a fight or no? I don't even know. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I like that fight then. Tali's ladies. I don't think. Tali's ladies needs a big win. I mean, he's. Yeah, well, Ladies needs a big win. He's won five straight and finished, I think, four or th three or four of them, three at least. Um, 
And so I think he's got good momentum going for himself and, and a big fight and a big win against uh, Bisping would certainly do wonders for him. So with that, I like that fight. Adam, what do you think? I, I'm cool with ladies. Um, I also like the idea of a Bisping Musashi match. Um, even if Musashi were to lose, I just like that matchup. I think you know the aggression of, of Bisping versus the patience of Musashi would be very good. Yeah, I like that one. We'll move on to the co-main event of the evening, which who would have thunk it? We got it, and we ended up getting it. Uh, Quentin Rampage Jackson getting his fight back after the injunction was uh, overruled. Um, Earlier in the week, uh, it was a catchweight 215-pound fight, him versus Mavio, Fabio Maldonado. And I got to say, I was very surprised by how Jackson looked. He looked much different than I've ever seen him. I mean, he, he didn't look like Pride Jackson. He looked like the old first-time tier UFC Jackson. He didn't even look like the Jackson. He didn't like the wrestle. He looked like a guy who trained with a kickboxer his whole fight camp. Um, I was very surprised. He utilized the, the tie plum a lot. He threw leg kicks, even threw a head kick for the first time in ever, I believe. Um, it was a very interesting performance, I would say. Uh, definitely, if, if, if that's the kind of new style that Quentin wants to utilize, he's definitely got to work on it a little more. Um, but I, I definitely commend him on his uh, his improvements or, or attempts to improve. Um, like I said, I thought that you know while his style – uh, change up look nice um, there's some areas he can improve there but uh, overall it was a decent performance he ended up getting the the obvious win in my opinion um, and I do like that he's changing it up and uh, if he does you know it'd be interesting for sure and uh, I think if he were to fight somebody if he does end up fighting for the UFC again uh, after he's able to deal with all this court uh, Bellator injunction issue nonsense out of the way um, I would think maybe the winner of Lil Nog Shogun makes sense. I don't. I mean, he's asking for rematches for some of the guys that he's lost to. I mean, uh, uh, thus far, I don't know if he's fought. Uh, he hasn't fought Lil Nog before, so I would think that that fight makes sense right there. Uh, the winner of that fight, Adam. What do you think? Um, I don't know what it was. I was watching that fight. I watched this entire card sound off. So um, I was I wasn't overly impressed with Rampage. I do like that he had to do wrinkles and do a striking, but even then, it's like, you know, you're facing Fabio Maldonado. Take him down. Round and pound. He was what has always been probably his biggest strength that he's neglected completely. I wanted to see something like that, and I still didn't see it. So, I mean, I like the fact he was adding at elbows. He was finally throwing kicks for the first time since 2002. So that's always a plus. But, um, I don't know. You know, obviously the the cardio is an issue. You can use the injunction as an excuse, but if you always thought you were going to fight, train as if you're going to fight. I don't know why he wouldn't do that. So I don't like using that as an excuse. Um, also, once again, it was Fabio Maldonado, an opponent that was tailored to him to fight. Eh, you know, he's, he's better than when he left, but is, is, is that going to be, is that going to do much for him? I don't know. It's going to take a different kind of matchup than this, and a more impressive performance to impress me. Same. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, and uh, Adam, by the way, what do you think of that? Uh, wh wh who would you want to see him fight next? Oh, I, you know, like, like you said, probably, I mean, maybe even Rashad Evans. I mean, Quentin Jackson's kind of at showcase fight point of his career where just put him in fun matchups or give him matchups the fans want to see. And I, I think they tune in for Evans again, and Evans himself has said that he'd be down for it. So... I'd say that because I know Shogun's uh, still talking about a possible drop to 85. So, I don't know. Chris? Yeah, I wasn't anything overly impressed with that fight. Same as you guys. We thought it was fun that Rampage added some new things. But I don't think that he should stray too far away from throwing those big hooks because that's what wins him fights a lot of the time. He just has to tighten up that takedown defense. He seems like so stubborn that he doesn't want He doesn't care about grappling whatsoever. So... If he faces another grappler and he doesn't prepare, it's not going to go well for him. What the good thing for him is that if he does remain in the UFC, he beat a guy who's ranked 12th in Fabio Maldonado. It's just ranked because he's a really tough guy, even though I don't know why he's ranked ahead of Patrick Cummins, who's a much better fighter than he is at this point. But, um, yeah, it could get Rampage ranked. It would make for some fun matchups. The bottom of light heavyweight rankings aren't good at all. So, um, yeah, yeah, I could agree with both of you guys on uh, Rampage can fight uh, Shogun versus uh, Noguera winner, or he can take on Rashad Evans. But uh, if Rashad's open to it, coming back off ACL surgery, which 
would be a good matchup. I think Rashad wins that fight pretty handily again. And um, unless he's looking for a title shot, they could make that one. But um, it also depends on how long it takes with this injunction thing, how long that's going to keep Rampage out for for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, not too much to say about that one. It was exciting to see Rampage mix it up. But aside from that, I wasn't overly entertained by this fight. All right, and we'll move on to the main event of the evening, Demetrius Johnson versus Kyoji Horiguchi, a fight in which I was thoroughly entertained. I was surprised how, um, well, I guess not surprised. I mean, I figured Kyoji would put up a great fight. Um, he did until the later round start to hit, which, of course, Demetrius is known to always thrive in thus far um, in his career. And so, you know, uh, of course, there was there was barely any round that I gave Kyoji. Demetrius owned basically every minute of that fight. And, um but he looked great doing it. So fast, so competitive. Kyoji kept uh kept him working and competing and it was such a it was such a dominating performance even still, regardless of everything that uh Demetrius had to work through, whether it was uh, the striking or um or the grappling, Kyoji defending well on, on both stances and I, I thought that no matter what, Demetrius knew that he just had to keep outworking him and outpacing him, and of course, he utilized uh, what's becoming a, a good gas tank of his that he has um, to to outwork Kyoji. And, and and in the end, I believe he was also that just that just that that big last burst of energy pushing that allowed him to to find the armbar position where Kyoji was still tired, having been on his back most of that round, and uh, and then found the arm and just torqued it so so well. It was perfect technique as well. Um, overall, perfect performance. Uh, ten out of ten for me for Demetrius Johnson. It was a great fight. Adam, what do you think? Um, kind of in the same way that I, when I was watching the Bisping fight, I'm thinking this is a Bisping kind of fight. It was a DJ kind of fight, you know. Or Gucci in the beginning, I, I liked the way he was coming in, and but you knew he wasn't gonna be able to keep that up for five rounds. You know, DJ can keep up when he was doing five rounds. There's this one point in like the second or third round where I felt the tide of the fight really changed. That was when he, he came in, landed like a four punch combination to the to the face of Horiguchi, and then immediately shot him for a take. And I'm like, DJ's taking over. He's got this fight. You know, Horiguchi isn't gonna land that knockout blow with the coin. I don't see how Horiguchi can win. And obviously, you know, he kept doing what he was doing. That armbar was really nice. You know, pinched the leg, got a good little uh, extra bit of leverage on that, which you don't see a lot of people do sadly. Is pinch the leg. But um, you know, that was just Demetrius Johnson being. You know, you can make the argument he's the best fighter in the world because unlike unlike John Jones and unlike Weidman, unlike Aldo, he's never had that fight that's even been close. The closest one was uh, in Chicago against uh, uh, Dodson, and even then, you clearly knew Johnson won the fight. So, you know, what's next for him? That's that's the big question. Does he move up for Dillashaw? Does he just does he go against Dodson again? You know. Who can challenge him? That's the question. Yeah, it seems yeah, like... I think, oh, I go think ahead, we Chris. see uh, Dotson in there next with him if he's able to beat Zach Mikowski just because of what Dotson was able to do. He dropped him three times in the first two rounds just that DJ was able to take over for them and Dotson wasn't able to finish. But um, I think Dotson's still a credible challenger if he's able to land because that guy can put anyone out at flyweight. Uh, as for the fight itself, um, yeah, in the beginning, I think... First, Kyoji, due stats wise, doesn't get as much credit as he deserves. He got taken down 14 to 22 times, but that doesn't really tell that uh, DJ. What a lot of the times early in the fight wasn't able to really keep him down for too long. Horiguchi defended pretty well. It took him a while to get those takedowns. He made DJ work a lot, especially early on. He made DJ work for the takedowns. He made him work for every position he had early. I mean, it was a fun fight. I wasn't. Like overly excited, I, it, uh, they're always fast paced, especially with these two guys. But um, DJ was winning every portion of the fight. Yeah, Horiguchi made it close in some aspects and made him work for everything. But uh, DJ started taking over, as you said, Adam. Started taking over, got into his rhythm, started dominating in that fifth round, especially. He just controlled Horiguchi for the whole round, and then uh, one second left. That was the most impressive thing about this fight. One second left in our bar, especially the way he set it up. He was looking for arm locks earlier in the third and fourth rounds. He came close to them. He looked at them, but um, that last last second, DJ will, will never stop looking for the finish. One second left, finishing a, a fight that's just super impressive, especially in a championship fight. That he's that aware of the time. He's that aware of all of his surroundings that he knows exactly what to go for, exactly when to go for it. And uh, 
yeah, he's one of the best fighters in the world. He's definitely in my top three pound for pound. So I think we'll see a dodson Makovsky winner next. There's not many challenges left for this guy, though, because basically everyone below him, he's beat outside of, like, the top. Once you get below the top ten, there might be a few guys, but there aren't really many out there. Maybe you see Henry Cejudo in the near future before DJ, because DJ's too small to move up again at 35, I think. He might get a fight with Dillashaw, but he needs some more competition there at 125. Agreed. Again, but that was some, um, you know, uh, as I can say, my overall view is of, yeah, it looks, that was a, a great card. I had so much fun watching it, and, um, you know, I, I, I love it when cards that are, uh, you know, given, I mean, I guess the, the ringer from, you know, fans and critics and MMA media alike saying that this might not be a good card. On paper, it's not a good card, um, but, you know, ended up uh, providing loads of entertainment, and uh, it was a fun fight. I loved it. I had a great time with it. Um, other than that, I would like to see uh, Henry Cejudo in the future. I am becoming a big fan of his. He's uh, he certainly uh, looks like he has a possible type of style that could really give DJ problems. He definitely certainly needs to uh, improve on certain aspects in both uh, both the grappling and wrestling, and, and uh, I mean uh, both the grappling and striking. But should um. Should Henry Cejudo be next, which I think he will, I would hope that it, it it's a fight that makes sense. I feel like Kyoji was kind of rushed into that position. Um, even he agreed with that. Kyoji didn't even ask for this fight and, uh, you know, next after his last fight. And yet he got it anyway. And it was more so because they just needed somebody to give to DJ and that was the guy. Um, with that being said, I hope that, you know, uh, Dodson provides a, a decent challenge, if not the uh, an even better challenge than before. Uh, should he be the one to take on Makovsky? If Makovsky wins, that would be a huge upset. And uh, he would rightfully have deserved a chance, uh, deserve a chance at uh, Demetrius Johnson. So, um, with that being said, I think we're done overreviewing this fight. Now, let's talk about this crazy rumor that has been circling all day Sunday. Um, John Jones apparently got into and this is what is being reported in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He apparently was in uh a uh in a vehicle accident with his car. Um now I've heard left and right the rumors or and the and the and the what the, what the thoughts may have you that they are, what the facts are we don't know. Um it hasn't been completely um made a made aware. I have an article here from uh, MMA fighting that I'll just read. Um the UFC, uh, UFC champ John Jones being sought for questioning in a hit and run car accident. Albuquerque Police Department uh, spokesman told uh, the MMA media on, on Sunday, which is today, a uh, middle aged woman's car was struck Sunday morning in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the uh, the offender in the other vehicle fled the uh, fled the scene. The case is currently under investigation by the Albuquerque PD, who would like to speak with Jones regarding the matter. Um, the make and model of the car has, has yet to be identified. There is no warrant out for Jones' arrest. Um, they are just per, uh, currently just seeking him out for questioning. Um, thus far, that's all the information that we have. Um, nor can Albuquerque police confirm that John Jones was involved in the accident anyway. So um, it's still an ongoing investigation. It kind of seems like it may have been him. We don't know, but we've heard a bunch of rumors saying that there might have been drugs in the vehicle or this or that. Uh, thus far, it's hearsay. Um, the police department isn't saying that that's the case. Uh, thus far, maybe because they can't until they maybe uh, press charges. Um, um, so from right now, all it seems to be is a vehicle accident and whoever was driving the car that hit this middle-aged woman fled the scene. Uh, I can't say if John Jones is a suspect yet. But um, it seemed, but the fact that his name has come out from the Albuquerque PD certainly doesn't bode well for John Jones, um, especially if we don't know if it was his car or not, since the, the Albuquerque PD will not give up the uh, the make and model of the car. Um, with that being said, that would be crazy if this is true, and it would be very unfortunate. Um, yeah, it's not looking good. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know what to make of this at this point, but you know. Um, uh, thus far, the UFC has yet to comment on it uh, per our press time. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's not really much to say on it. I just hope that he doesn't get pulled off from it. If he does, that would absolutely suck. Anybody that knows me knows I am extremely excited for the Jones-Johnson fight because I absolutely 100% believe that Anthony Johnson wins that fight. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, other than my surprise at this, other than my surprise at this fact, 
Um, thus far, I mean, it's just a waiting game until we know exactly what's going on. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, man, I, I've been hearing so many different rumors. Oh, we heard so much with, shit. Yeah, first we heard he no, failed no, his no, drug no, test, no. and then we heard he was in a domestic violence dispute, and then we and then it came around to this, uh, to this, uh, to this car act, this hit and run, um, yeah, incident. At so. first, I heard he was injured. I heard domestic violence. I heard so many different things that it's hard to like even know if it's true or what's going on exactly. Yeah, exactly. But it seems like what actually is going on is that John Jones may have been involved in a hit and run, and there's a possibility that he was inebriated. And I heard there was possibly cocaine in the car, which is not may, may or may not be true. We don't know yet. It hasn't been mentioned in in any reports that I've like yeah, any I credible reports. You know? Yeah, I don't want to speculate anything. That's we all we can do. Been, you can't speculate anything. We just haven't heard the definite of what happened. We may be here tomorrow, the day after. We're not entirely sure yet. But um, yeah, this would suck if it's true. If John Jones winds up getting um taken in and is unable to compete at UFC 187, that would be that would be a detriment to that card. It would still be a great card. It's still stacked top to bottom. And we'd still have a championship fight on there, but right now it's a great card. It's one of the best cards of the year, possibly ever. So that would really hurt that card if John Jones pulled off. And I don't know what they would do from there. And honestly, I don't think that's the main concern right now. We just have to hope that this woman who got hit is all right. Hopefully, John Jones wasn't involved. Hopefully, he's all right mentally. I don't know. He did, if this is true, John Jones really has to start making better life decisions. I don't want to judge him for the decision he made, but he's on. He's obviously going to be held on a pedestal. He's a UFC champion. He's sponsored by some of the biggest companies in the world. He has to start acting like a professional if this is the case. And I don't know where they would go for UFC 187 if they just removed that fight completely, depending on what happens with Jones, if anything. I don't know if they remove Jones from the title they strip him of his title I would assume so if he gets taken in and it's confirmed that it was him and he gets arrested I would assume the UFC would try to get away from him just because of the decisions he's been making and I would strip him of the title at that point that seems like the thing you have to do same thing when, when Anthony Johnson was um, reported to be involved in domestic violence the UFC uh, put the, him at a distance. They suspended him until things were cleared up and found out that it was not true. The charges were dropped. Anthony Johnson was brought, brought right back in. No harm, no foul. They have to take that same approach here if this happens to be true. And with that fight, if it is true, do you make an interim fight? If John Jones gets stripped, do you keep AJ in there? Maybe you put DC in there, take him out of the beta fight? I don't know what you do because there aren't a lot of guys that are credible challenges right at this point. Fair enough. Uh, also, by the way, another thing um, that just came out is Dana White has been informed of this, from what I'm seeing here. Um, uh, President Dana White said himself that he was uh, still trying to gather the facts. Both Malki Kawa and, um, and John Jones' attorney, uh, and Ophir Ventura, um, have yet to respond to any messages, uh, and Dana White himself has also stated that he has yet to get a hold of John, uh, John himself, so, I don't know, uh, I don't know. It's just in, um, Ariel Hawani just tweeted two minutes ago, expect a statement from the UFC regarding the John Jones situation very shortly. Oh, shit, okay, we'll just keep, we'll just keep talking, oh, I don't know, Adam, no, what are your thoughts on this? Um, uh, another tweet out there. From Mark Ramondi, Albuquerque PD, UFC champ John Jones officially named suspect in hit and run accident. Oh, shit. On SB Nation, on MMAfighting.com. <gasps> what it looks like. So I, that's a credible source, so it's not looking good, guys. Oh, shit. Adam, any comment? Up until that point, all of it was like, you know, he might have done this, he might have been that. Once, you know, credible sources get in the mix, you know, Aaron Helwani's tweet means nothing. That could be the UFC stating that there was no issue. He's still on. Um, but, you know, the worst thing I can think that could happen is that he's a suspect, and then in the end, nothing happens. He's not found guilty of anything, but he yanked from the fight anyway for PR reasons. That would fuck flow. That would suck. Yeah. Um, no, that would suck. In the long run, for that's sure. The scenario at this point. I think that's far from the worst case scenario. I'm talking about from a, from a fan perspective and from a job. I mean, 
Yeah, sure, it'd be yeah. worse if he was guilty of this. Someone died, and he's fucking in jail, and that was bad on everyone. But, um... Yeah, and the tweet, the Hawani tweet may not mean much at this point, but if MMA Fighting's posting that he's officially named the suspect, that's a little bit... He's a that's, suspect. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, at, at this point, it sucks because the event's so close now. So, I mean, if this happened two months out, it'd probably all be resolved if we'd have an answer by fight time, but... You know, life happens, shit happens. So, yeah. I mean, thankfully they have a backup main event. So they got that going for them. But this... Un until there's details, I really don't want to say much. Because, I mean, yeah, at first it was... John Jones was high on cocaine, hit a woman, and left. That, that, yeah. was, that was reported by Front Row Brian, who's, you know... Hit and miss on his stories. He's sometimes spot on, and he can be the furthest thing from the truth. Yeah, that's definitely true. He sometimes he's the first guy on the scene too, so you never know with him. Exactly. So I mean, you got you got to give him some kind of benefit of the doubt, but you also have to question that source. But when other sources come out, um, and if if he is officially named a suspect, like I said, they could move him off the card because he's a suspect. But just being a suspect alone doesn't mean anything. You got to keep yeah. that. And so. Well, I wonder if if uh, if him being a suspect in any case, and he's not being cooperative in it, you know, certainly. The, the athletic commission would not license him. Um, yeah. And it's yet to be confirmed if he even has been licensed for that fight. So And so I'm going to assume that he's not yet. Yeah, um, it's definitely a, it's a wait and see kind of situation. We have to see how this plays out. It's going to take a decent a bit to actually find out what goes on, maybe a few days. Hopefully we'll know more by then. But as of right now, we just got to wait. Definitely. Quite a quite a conundrum we have. <laughs> Do we have any uh, fan questions this episode, Nick? Uh, we have a couple. I only have a few. Most right. of them are from uh, from 186 at the end of it that I got. All right, if you want to take care of those, and maybe Let's do, do we have anything else to talk about? No, I don't think we do. It's been a it's been a quite it was a quiet lead up to 186 up until the yeah. fights. Not surprisingly. So, yeah, and then um. And then, yeah, this is the only big piece of news that's hit thus far. Uh, first question, do um, why do you feel Demetrius Johnson – oh, this is from um, – who is this? Abier, Abier? It's a A-U-B. It's basically spelled like Olivier, but with an A-U and a B. Um, Abier, <laughs> Abier uh, asks um, – why do I? Why do we think uh, Demetrius Johnson is the least uh, cherished fighter? He's one of the best and shows it every time he's out there. Yet people can't seem to get behind him. What's the deal? Uh, That's easy. I'm sorry. That's easy. An easy one. Well, I don't know. it's 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 complicated for me, but I mean, it could be a number of things, honestly. But I just think that you know, I, I spoke on this before. I mean, I think when it got when a division starts off, and you have somebody that's just so dominant, it kind of kills a lot of the you know what i mean like ronda rousey people want to say that her division isn't stacked and i disagree with that i just think that ron is just so good she makes that division look like it's not you know and demetrius is kind of in the same boat john dodson's a great fighter uh you know J joseph benavidez is a, a terrific fighter moraga has thus far proven he is a terrific fighter i mean uh from what i've seen all he the only two people he's lost to are dodson and johnson um you know, and uh, of course, you know, Ali Bagatinov for, you know, regardless of how that fight went and it sucks that he got popped uh, prior. Who knows if he was doing it before? I'm going to assume he wasn't, though. Uh, you know, looked terrific going into that. You know, I mean, all of his opponents, with probably the exception of Chris Carriasso, to be fair, um, have been credible opponents, you know, in my opinion. I don't think that, you know, I mean, people want to say that that division is shallow. Maybe it kind of is now because contenders aren't rising up as quick as Demetrius is putting them down. Um, but I, I think it could be that. I think it's more so uh, – it, it, you certainly can't blame Demetrius Johnson. I don't think that he has a boring style. I, I love watching him fight. I think he's a very exciting fighter to watch. Um, so when people tell me he's not an exciting fighter to watch, I, I don't get that. Um, because I don't see it. I don't see what's boring about him. Um, he's not as crazy violent or aggressive as some guys are. He's not a just bleed fighter. He's so technical. And that's one of the, one of the things I love about watching him fight. He's so, and he's so active. He's so fast. He's so, it, it, that makes, you know, for a fun fight, like with Kyoji, Kyoji was trying to match his speed. He didn't do it too well, but, um, just seeing a fast paced fight play out the way that it did, um, you know, 
with his fights generally. I, I enjoy watching mm -hmm. him fight. So I really don't get it, to be honest with you. And it's a matter of me uh, seeing that, you know, I just think that if, I bet you if he had the mouth on him that Connor has, he'd be one of the most popular fighters in the world because of the way his style is, you know. I mean, uh, I'll tell you what, Floyd Mayweather is, is uh, one of the most popular fighters in the world right now. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say he has the most exciting style. He's got a very effective style for sure, just like Demetrius. Um, I would say Demetrius is more fun to watch. But, you know, like like Floyd, he promotes the hell out of every single fight that he uh, competes in. And uh, that's why he's always got so many, so much eyes on him. He's always promoting, always getting people to watch, always committing to getting people to, to want to watch him either get his ass whooped or get the victory. Um, Demetrius isn't that kind of guy. He's way, more, way too humble, way too respectful, and he doesn't do much other than train and fight and win. That's it. And so for me, it's it's definitely a conundrum. You seem to say it's a it's an easy answer, so I definitely would like to hear what yours right. is. I think it's a very easy answer. Uh, to add on to what you said, I agree with a lot of what you said, but uh, weight class and personality. Those are the two words that come to mind to answer this question. Uh, weight class. A lot of people outside of hardcore fans really aren't into fights under certain weights. They don't really want to watch guys who are five foot three, even though they're technical as hell and can beat the hell out of most anyone in the world. Mm. They don't want to watch them. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I have friends who are casual fans of the sport. They don't like watching fights under 55, under 45, whatever. But I, I don't get it either. I don't get why they – I mean, I guess because there aren't as many knockouts statistically in that division. Some casual fans don't really understand grappling, so they just want to see guys go out there and throw. And you see that a lot more in the heavyweights and stuff like that. But um, that could explain part of it. And then personality. If, Like you said, if he was a guy like Connor – people be watching he's not a guy like connor so people aren't watching he he's just goes in there he's a very humble guy a hard-working guy he just says he doesn't say anything really too controversial just goes in there fights wins wins impressively he doesn't have, he's not a big guy he's not knocking out guys much aside from that big benavidez knockout so yeah a lot of people aren't too excited to see him fight i don't i from a fan t standpoint i understand why in those certain aspects i like watching him fight some of his fights aren't the most exciting because he just outclasses his opponents and it, it that has nothing to do with him though that's just how good he is and his personality he doesn't have that conor mcgregor floyd mayweather personality where it doesn't matter how their fights go even though conor's fights have gone very well floyd isn't too exciting to watch all the time and he still gets record-breaking numbers basically every time he fights and I think that has a lot to do with his personality. If DJ had more personality, maybe more people would be watching if he said more controversial things. But that's just not the guy he is. So I think it's a pretty easy explanation. Adam, what about you? What do you think? Um, well, first off, I think it's kind of important to talk about what it's like to watch Demetrius Johnson in person. I've seen him in person. And it's very hard to appreciate what you do, what he does when you're in the arena and you're not like up close to him getting multiple camera angles. It's really hard to see at that speed and, honestly, the size of them, what they're doing. So I think one of the problems is he's a hard, he's, he's a lot better to watch on TV, but when the crowd isn't 100% into the fight because they can't really grasp what's going on, that takes away from how big the fight feels. If the crowd's not involved, the fight doesn't feel as big, the fight doesn't feel as exciting. I think that's genuinely... Uh, one of the reasons why his fights always seem to be a little bit duller in, in that point. Um, I think the other big key is he, Demetrius Johnson, is a fighter for the fight fan. He's not a fighter for the casual fan. He's just not. He, everything he does is so quick and so technical that if you don't know what's going on, you really can't appreciate it. If you haven't, you know, watched the sport for a long time and understand ins and outs of certain aspects of the sport, you're not going to enjoy what you see because you're not seeing the big thudding fight, the, the big thudding, you know, shots. You're not seeing – his takedowns are explosive, but because he's 5'2", they just simply don't look as good to the, to the average viewer. So I think one of the things is while he is, in my opinion, very a, a fun fighter to watch, I think Floyd Mayweather is a fun fighter to watch because while he's defensive, it's hilarious watching him just make other people – look like complete fools by simply being defensive. I, I thoroughly enjoy that. So, I mean, it, it's also, you know, what does each person enjoy to watch? And I, I really feel that in in DJ's case, because 
he, his style, no matter what you do, because of his size and the way he fights, just will never appeal to the mass audience. Unless he goes on like a six, seven, eight year run and no one's even coming close. And maybe he says something once. I'm sure you all read that quote where he's like, you know, I didn't know it was my job to promote myself, not to promote, yeah. promote me. We spoke about that on the last podcast. Yeah, I think I think I remember you guys talking about that too. And it's just like, you know, like Dana White at one point a couple years ago said, it's not my job to get you to watch the fights. Yes, it is. <laughs> you promote the fights. You run the show. You <laughs> want people watching the event. Make them watch your event. So, yeah, it's just, you know, he's not going to get that push from Dana White as long as the ratings don't come in. But the ratings won't come in unless he gets that push by Dana White. Dana White will give him all the credit in the world when it's the fight week for a Demetrius Johnson fight. Other than that, he's largely ignored. So, I don't think that does it all, though. Like, what do you mean? I don't think Dana pushing him does everything for him to make him into this big draw. No, it goes both ways. Um, you yeah. know, Dana White pushes the shit out of Ronda Rousey because Ronda Rousey pushes the shit out of herself. Maybe yeah. Um, you, Chris you Weidman, have to push yourself really as a personality. Himself. Yeah. Yeah, his personality. And Chris Weidman doesn't really push himself, but he has the added advantage of being the guy that knocked out Anna Silva. Yeah. That always helps. When you do that on one of the biggest stages in the world, people are going to take notice. Definitely. Paper and uh, to add just to a quick point, is that even, like, Demetrius' style, it lends into kind of that, like, in some of his fights, not all of them, but he winds up taking the guy down and controls him very well. And that is kind of compares to, even as a huge jiu-jitsu guy myself, sometimes sport jiu-jitsu could be really boring to watch. So I guess a little bit of that goes into it. It's detail that you can't see unless you really know what's going on. Even when you really know what's going on, a lot of it's feel, a lot of it's like the, the slight positioning of an arm that will never translate to the TV. Yeah. Like, sometimes I could be watching sports jiu-jitsu and just guys are some of the best guys in the world, even though they're doing little intricate things. Some guys just, especially in points, when they're going for points, like MMA, you're going to win a round. In jiu-jitsu, you're going for points. Some guys can pass once and stall. So, yeah, there are that, things that, like that that, that happen. That the Gracies have been panned for for a long time is defending submission, holding that position. That's how the Gracies have won a lot of things. So, you know... Yeah, I I had a point and then I lost it midway through my rambling. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I certainly enjoy watching him fight. I really think that you know if he could get fans em emotionally invested in him the way that Floyd does, but he does it in a way where he like he gets people to hate on him enough to where they want to watch just to see if he gets his ass whooped. <laughs> which of course never happens. So then they get mad, and so then they're like the next guy that fights him needs to whoop his ass, and then on and on and on. Um. He's got a nice trend going. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, fighters could definitely get people to emotionally invest um, in, in them. And then, you know, they, they would certainly get more eyes. I mean, they're, uh, they're, the only reason certainly that I could think of that anybody wanted to watch this fight was to see Demetrius Johnson fight, just fight. There was no heat. There was no, oh, this guy's this or this guy's that. Or watch, you're going to see me do something insane or, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And all he said leading up to this fight was, I've done this and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give him my all. <laughs> That's it. That's all he said. <laughs> um, which is not a bad way of thinking. I mean, it's, I mean, it's certainly like, you know, um, I mean, when any any of fighter that comes in here, certainly he certainly doesn't come out looking like a businessman or talking like one or treating himself like a business. He's treating himself like a fighter, like the best fighter on the planet, and he just basically trains, eats right, does everything right by himself, you know, and uh, and gets it done in the, in the cage, and that's it. That's all he does, you know, and to to be the successful. Um, I guess no, I wouldn't say successful, but to to be the popular fighter that people always want to look at and watch and see doing all these incredible things, you know, you gotta invest in yourself and promote yourself and make sure people know your name at all times. You know, that's why, uh, you know, it certainly benefits Connor that he's getting this six fight series that was announced yesterday or not yesterday. Yeah, that that's silly. Well, I wouldn't say silly, but it's just weird that they're doing a six fight series. Um, or six not episodes. six episode yeah. series. Yeah, it's funny. He's getting a. <laughs> the funniest thing I heard about it was he's getting a. He's getting <laughs> his own sh uh, show that has more episodes than Connor has fights in the UFC. That's pretty funny. 
<laughs> it's pretty funny, but I mean, the guy, he pushes himself, he promotes himself, and they're trying to promote him, and they're doing a good job of it, so can't really blame them there. Yeah, I mean, uh, if certainly if, if Demetrius can kind of get more in tune with the fans, uh, he'd get he'd get higher ratings and higher numbers because I mean that's the biggest difference than any fighter that's 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 uh, that I certainly wouldn't say is that at his skill level yet they get more eyes on them because they get people to emotionally invest in them. And uh, uh, do we have any other questions come up? I think we're Demetrius Johnson out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just hope that uh you know he takes some kind of lesson from it. I certainly think a, a John Dotson rematch would certainly get a, a decent amount of viewers. Probably not as much as the first one, but you know um I'm sure people seeing Dotson again would 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 be interested. I certainly would be interested if Mikoski can get the upset. Um. But we'll see what happens. Uh, other than that, I, I, I am excited to see Demetrius fight when he does fight again. Um, Adam, any final thoughts? I don't know if I mentioned anything you wanted to comment on. Uh, on, on, like, DJ? Or yeah, levels? or, yeah, and anything. Like I said, I mean, I don't, I don't really think it'll matter what DJ does. I don't think he'll ever be as popular as the really popular guys. Even, like, like Chris said, even if Dana White pushes the hell out of him. He just... He just He's just not the kind of guy that the average guy will, will sit down and watch. A lot of that's to do with just the way he looks, the way he acts. His fights are very hard to follow if you're not in with the sport. But it doesn't mean he's not the best fighter in the world. You can, Like I said earlier, you can easily make the argument that he is. I probably would because I've never seen him even show an inkling of being anything other than great. I've, I haven't seen a moment where he didn't look like he was going to win a fight. Even the Dotson fights when he got dropped. He was right back up, back to running those rounds. So, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I really don't think there's anything he can do. Yeah. Certainly. With that being said, I guess we'll move on to the next question. Um, real quick. Who do you see being the next contender in the uh, strawweight division? It seems so wide open, and I honestly think that if Pena beats Lima, she's next. But what do you think about Paige Van Zandt or any other contenders out there? Hmm. Well, strawweight has certainly become very exciting. There were two very good strawweight fights on this card. Uh, um, right now, I would certainly agree. I think Jessica Panay being ranked where she is, if she gets a win against uh, Juliana Lima on the upcoming... Is that this weekend? That's not this weekend, is it? That's not this uh, weekend. I'm sure. It's soon, though. It is soon. It's coming up in May, for sure. The winner of that fight will definitely... Should definitely... Uh, be next, uh, especially if it's Panay. Panay is a very credible challenger, I think, and, and, a, and a very, I think, a bigger threat to uh, Joanna Jonjacic style than Carla was, um, both on the feet and on the ground. Um, I wouldn't say just, uh, Jessica has better takedowns. Um, I would say she's definitely the more decorated grappler. Um, who could really give her issues down there, um, either on her back or on top. We know Panay has an uh, excellent jiu-jitsu game. And so, um, but she's also taking on another girl, um, another girl in Lima who also happens to have a, a terrific style herself. So that being said, I think that sh that'll turn out to be a great fight, great scrambles we'll probably see on the ground. Uh, I think it's too early for Paige, in my opinion. I think it's way too early. I think they'll want to build her up a little before they uh, they commit to um, you know getting her a title shot, especially so early. I, I think it would be uh, not a waste of talent. She's so young. She's still got way more time to develop and get better. And so with that, I think that Paige is too early. I can't think of anybody else, honestly. Maria Moroz with a terrific victory in Poland uh, against uh, Joanna Calderwood. Who knows for her? I think it's all too early for her as well, but that's a, a very possible contender in the near future, I think. Um, Adam, I'll let you go first. As far as straw weight, um, it, it's, I think <laughs> it's a far more intriguing division than 135, but mainly because the champion is much more vulnerable. That being said, I think there's like, there's a good like, Four or five girls you could possibly put in there, or match up in a number one contenders fight. I mean, I don't think you can put Carla in a one win and back a title contention kind of fight, even though she's been dominant up until that point. She just got beat down too much. Paige, she's young, she's very, I don't want to say inexperienced, but fresh to the sport. But that doesn't stop the UFC from giving someone like that a shot too soon. Whether or not it's too soon, too soon we find out when they fight. Um. Who is that one chick you said fought in Poland? Uh, I remember that fight. I can't remember her name. Maria Moroz? Yeah, I mean... 
Oh, Marina Moroz, I'm sorry. Like, I, 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 I vaguely remember that fight, but I also remember not being very good looking, if I'm right. <laughs> no, no, you laugh. That's a fucking uh, Being good looking gets you, gets you out of MMA. That's, <laughs> that's not true. Ah, uh, jeez. Uh, I mean, say what you want about it, but it's a completely true statement. But, uh, <laughs> it's hard to pick out that standout 115er right now. I honestly thought Marina looks alright. All right. Yeah, Marina looks all right to me. I'm thinking of someone. What's her name again? Let me look her up. Look her up. I thought she looked all right. She looked cute. No, she's all right looking. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, to add on to your point, I kind of do agree that it's easier to get a title shot as a female if you're attractive and able to build yourself the way Paige has. Well, it's the same thing for men. The more you, the, the more popular you are with, uh, and you got good numbers, you got good momentum on your side, you're more likely to get a title shot over somebody that could possibly be more deserving these days. And that's just oh, seems yeah, to be a but thing. just because you're a good-looking dude doesn't mean you're going to get a Oh, title well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm <laughs> saying that's just an added thing to something that's already the same with men. You know what I mean? I think it has its differences, but yeah, I, I get where you're going with that. Yeah. Well, looks draw ratings for women far in, in a yeah. much bigger sense than they do for men, but I mean, you're right. It's a male dominated, it's male dominated sport. Yeah, the demographic is the 18 to 35 year old male, and we like seeing hot chicks. That's why there's no ring card guys. Yeah. <laughs> True. Oh, God, thank God. Thank oh, God. Uh. <laughs> uh, for me, I'm sorry, I that was too funny. agree with your point, Nick. I think um, Penne with a win gets the fight against uh, Jan Jacek. And, um, Paige, yeah. What did, what did Adam say? She's good looking. Oh, yeah. Ha. Uh, and, you know, yeah. she has that added point where she did a great job of promoting herself after the fight, calling out Joanna right after. Went right to yeah, her face, said, yeah, that was smart. Definitely yeah. smart. I don't know if that gets her a title shot. I no, I'm not saying that. it does, but, you know, yeah. it's certainly something that. Set something up. Yeah. It, it's she certainly. can win again, you know, set something up. But, uh, as for, uh. Page, as I was saying, um, we spoke about her at length after it went over Felice Herrick. I don't think she's ready for a title shot, and I don't think she'll get one next. I think she needs another win or two, and I think the UFC wants to build her up a little bit more. She ha- She's very marketable. She's able to push herself because she's so attractive, and she gets a Reebok sponsorship, and she wins her fights. That So far, she's undefeated in the UFC, so yeah, I can see Paige getting a shot not too far in the future depending how she gets matched up i like it i think we'll close off there the rest of these questions are kind of silly to be honest with you um but uh i am excited for flyweight i'm excited for straw weight i love the lo- i love the lower weights it's getting good for me um coming up this wednesday we will actually be having a packed card and i actually haven't told you yet chris because i keep forgetting to tell you things but um, we're going to have three Invicta fighters from Invicta FC 12. We're going to have the new um, – well, before I get to that one, we're going to have a – let me see. Let me get all their names. You told so me two. No, it's three. <laughs> I know, but you told me two. I'm sorry. I told you three. All right. So um, Ciara Eubanks, who got a terrific TKO victory in the first round. All right. Um, that one. Yeah, we'll be coming. <laughs> we'll be coming on Lacey Shookman, who also got a very impressive TKO victory in, I believe, the second round. I could be wrong. Tell me that one too, I think. We're yes, and that. now, uh, and our third and most recent guest to agree to come on is the new uh, Invicta FC strawweight champion, Livia Renata Souza, who won the belt uh, against Killer Bunny um, this past. Yeah, you definitely told me. You told me two of them, and I, you did tell me her too. I think you mentioned that you reached out to them, but you didn't know about all. All three of them will be coming on this uh, this upcoming episode. Episode thirty eight is gonna be packed. We're yeah, <laughs> I got a lot of work to do. Oh yeah, you gotta watch that event, dude. Just watch it. It was a terrific event, and uh, the three ladies uh, are the are the three stars of it, in my opinion. Um, I also tried to get um, Faith uh, Van Duen on, but uh, she has yet to respond. So, um, who did, in my opinion, get the most impressive submission of the card? So. Um, I, I, I remember tagging both you and Adam in it because it was a terrific submission. It, I didn't even know what to call that. Do you remember that, Adam? The video I sent you? It was, it was weird. It was, like a, it was like a side shove, but a rear naked shove. It was like a hybrid. Kind but of she thing. was in her half guard. It was so weird. It was it like, a, like inside out anaconda type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was really creepy. It was really weird. I had no um, name for it. I really didn't. I um, had to take a look at it again. I'm not entirely sure. Fans, if you don't know what we're talking about, it's on our page. Just go to our video section. You'll be able to see it. 
Um, just just like these dodos, who should do that right now? Um, Watching it right now, it's really odd. It is so odd. She's like in her half guard, but she has her turned. She has her basically in a forward twister, essentially, but with a rear naked choke. It's weird. No, that's like that's the issue. What's up? There's, there's, there's not a good camera shot of it. That's one of the issues. Yeah. That looks like half a rear naked choke, half a bulldog choke. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I don't know What's what to make arm? of it. What's up? Wasn't there an arm in? It looked like there was an arm in when I watched it. Yeah, she has an arm in, for sure. Oh, she does? Yeah, does she not? You can see it. How do you not see that? Yeah, she's well, got an arm in. I didn't get to the end of it. I, and it's, it is a very bad camera angle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I see it. Terrific submission. We couldn't get her on. She has yet to respond. But three ladies, three uh, of, of the stars of that card um, who got terrific victories. Um, Souza also being uh, uh, getting a terrific submission in the fourth round against uh, Kacha Killer Bunny. <clears throat> um, with a triangle choke, uh, I'm very excited to speak to her and, uh, and to all these ladies. And I'm uh, excited to have them on this Wednesday. Um that being said, you got to watch it. It's going to be a terrific episode packed with guests, um, the most we've ever had. Um, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Adam, i got to say thank you for joining up on here. I know it's late yeah, over there where you're at. On, and uh, yeah, fun, always love having you on. Chris, you're the man. That was a terrific interview. I know I heard parts of it. I can't wait to hear the rest of it uh, after we're done uh, here. Um, with that being said, I also want to say thanks again to Christian. Um Go ahead and uh, give the information out once again about his promotion uh, and uh, the summer series yeah, he's got going uh, on. Yeah, thanks again to, for Christian DeFerris for coming on. You can find uh, the Extreme Cage Fighting. You can find them on Instagram, and uh, I'm sure you can find them on Facebook as well. Uh, ECF 5 is going down Sunday, May 3rd at the Melrose Ballroom. You can get your tickets uh, through Melrose's Ballroom's website. So, uh, yeah, just listen to the interview. Christian gives the information, and you can get it there. Awesome. You can hit me up at Nick the Phantom on Twitter. And you can hit Chris Paliuga up at Chris uh, Paliuga, spelled P-A-G-L-I-U-C-A. And you can hit Adam up by messaging the MMA Discussion Facebook page. Because <laughs> 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 I don't even know. Do you have a Twitter? I don't even know. Yeah, you're no. not. Yeah, I figure. Yeah, so if you want to hit, talk to Adam, just message him on the on, or post on our wall. Do whatever the hell you want. Just get people. Yeah. Just get on that page, people. It's awesome. We we appreciate the love uh, that we're getting thus far. We've got uh, a lot of more traffic these days, so keep it going. We appreciate it, and um, we appreciate you guys that listen. Again, if you want to listen to us on on the on the go, SoundCloud is one of our newer. Uh, what would you call that? Uh programs to pick us up that allows us to put our podcast out there we're on SoundCloud, stitcher itunes youtube sports and of course our mma uh discussion facebook page so um we're you know there's it's really hard not to listen to us at this point um, yeah we're everywhere make sure to <laughs> rate review and subscribe to the podcast everywhere facebook uh itunes stitcher soundcloud Yes, definitely. And uh, we're going to be coming out with a sub episode coming up soon that I am going to do with Adam. I'm excited about it. Hopefully we'll get that done soon. Um, every, all that being said, we appreciate you guys. Tune in next, this Thursday for episode 38. 38. Yep. This is 37, correct? We're doing yep. so many these days. I'm losing track. Episode 37. Yes. Tune in. We love you. Thank you, guys. Have a good rest Bye. of the week. Until, the, until, uh, until episode 38. Later.